So this is Coraline, a movie for little kids, supposedly. Bodies. Now this might be the least kid-friendly movie that looks like a kid-friendly movie. Whilst nowadays kids are busy watching Skibbity Toilet, I was scared to sleep for weeks because somebody decided it would be a good idea to make a Stephen King level psychological thriller but for tiny children. Now look, Coraline was released in 2009 back when I was just four years old. I hated this movie with a passion for more than a decade now. I've never felt as much genuine fear again in my entire life. It was always my least favorite movie of all time and honestly still is to this day. It's the biggest piece of dog shit. The reasons I hate the movie are exactly why it is so damn amazing. Here's the thing, if you just glance at the poster or the DVD cover, you might assume Coraline is just another quirky Tim Burton-esque animation. You'd probably categorize it alongside The Nightmare Before Christmas or Corpse Bride. Ah, don't get me wrong, those were great films as well, but Coraline is just on a completely different level. One of the most genius aspects of Coraline is its use of stop motion animation. This style wasn't just a visual choice, it was integral to the film's eerie atmosphere. There's something about stop motion that makes everything feel just a little off. The jerky, deliberate movements make the characters feel more like puppets than people, and that adds an underlying sense of unease throughout the entire film. I mean, they even lower the frame rate on many occasions to strengthen that sense of uncanniness. Coraline. For a kids movie, there's still plenty of classic horror movie stuff, but it's done in a subtle way that doesn't make the parents turn off the film in the first five minutes. It takes familiar tropes, things we've seen a hundred times before in horror films, and uses them in ways that catch you off guard. At first, the film almost mocks these tropes like it's in on the joke with you. You see the black cat, the ominous lightning, the creaky floorboards, and you think okay I know where this is going but Coraline flips these moments on the head using them to create a false sense of security before plunging you into real terror. This constant back and forth between playing with cliches and delivering real fear is what makes Caroline so effective. It's not just relying on traditional horror techniques, it's using them to pull the rug out from under you. Each time you think you know what's gonna happen, the film twists it, <laughs> making you question whether you're watching something playful or something genuinely terrifying. This unpredictable blend of tension and humor is what keeps you on edge throughout never quite sure when the next real scare will strike. By the time the horror really unfolds, you've been subjected to so many false alarms that the real thing hits like a punch to the gut. Pacing is done really well in Coraline to mimic that disjointed and fragmented nature of a dream, especially in Nightmare. The story moves less like a narrative and more like dream logic. For instance, it skips from scene to scene without focusing on the how, which is exactly how your dreams work. You never remember the process of getting from one place to another, your mind just arrives there. Each fragmented scene begins without music, allowing the incredible sound design to take center stage. So immersive they pull you deeper into Coraline's world. In the real world, the pacing is much slower, especially at the start with Coraline's mundane reality. Again, this is a false sense of security. As soon as Coraline enters the other world, everything changes. Now, it is kind of important to point out here that she never actually goes back through the tunnel, which is one explanation for why things take a bizarre turn. You start with Mr. B being incredibly creepy. <laughs> And then of course these two dog ladies. There's a tall handsome beast in your future. A what? You might be thinking, damn, I don't remember this movie being so weird. Oh boy, this is not even close. When she goes back into the other world, it's when the tomfoolery really starts. We have this garden scene. I can't believe you did this. The mice show. And whatever this even was. All of these fragments simply feel like separate, unrelated dreams 
but then they're starting to bleed into one another. The real nightmare begins with the buttons. Oh boy, oh boy, these buttons are responsible for so many sleepless nights. To whoever came up with this monstrosity, I swear it's on site, you bu- Then you have the standard themes that every kid enjoys. You know, eating bugs. <sighs> best friend getting mutilated. Your mother turning into a spider. Two. Your father dying. Mm. Your best friend dying. Oh, why be? Just classic kid things. Things die down a bit when Coraline goes on side quest number 56, and then BAM. You dare disobey your mother! The climax hits you like a truck. And then just when you think everything's all good, never mind. It's kind of hard to explain how well crafted this movie was without watching it. It's pretty much the perfect mirror image of how a nightmare feels. It's so fluid and chaotic and surreal, with the concept that it's all a dream, very much a real possibility, which to be honest, somehow makes it even scarier than just some guy in a Halloween mask chasing people around. Okay, this is why you know the creators were truly evil. What makes Coraline really unsettling is how it takes those familiar, comforting, safe elements from childhood and distorts them into sources of fear and evil. Dolls, plushies, your bedroom, sleeping, home, even her parents. Things that should provide security are twisted into threats within the other world. The dolls become spies for the other mother, the bedroom becomes a trap, and sleep turns into a gateway to nightmares. Go to sleep. 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 Her home, once a symbol of safety, is warped into something sinister and her father is reduced to a lifeless puppet controlled by malevolent forces. Mother making me. <clears throat> Every marriage ever. By twisting these universal symbols of comfort, Caroline leaves children in a state of unease long after the film ends. This lingering anxiety forces young viewers to reconsider the very things they once trusted, making the movie's psychological impact all the more Haunting. Speaking of subverting the idea of safety, turning your mother into a monster has got to top that list. Apologize at once. The other mother is, without question, one of the most terrifying mothers in fiction. Scratch that, one of the most terrifying villains in fiction. She's basically Pennywise with a maternal twist. She fucks with your head from the very beginning. What makes her so creepy, you ask? Well, for one, she has buttons for eyes. Let's see, the way she's overly nice, almost smothering Coraline with affection and attention. It's unsettling because it doesn't even feel human. It feels calculated and cold. And also, did I mention she has buttons for eyes? For example, there's this nice moment towards the middle of the film where Coraline's real mother is portrayed more sympathetically to contrast the other mother. Her real mother is stressed, tired, maybe a bit neglectful, but she's human, flawed, and real. And she seemed genuinely upset. Won't be long. The rest of the climax after this can be almost interpreted as a manifestation of Coraline's fear and Guilt. Making your mother upset and then she doesn't get back home on time? Yeah, I can see how your mind could start wandering into some pretty dark situations. Good night, mom. What else makes the other mother so terrifying? Let's see. Hmm. Oh yeah, she turns into a spider modeled after depictions of sleep paralysis demons and starts collecting little children's eyes. That's cool. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if this was done by some mom who's finally had enough and was like, oh, you think I'm bad for making you eat vegetables? How about a spider mother who eats kids and has a weird fetish for buttons? Making the beacon of safety and comfort in a child's life into a grotesque monster is absolutely diabolical. Then there's the ending. Let's be honest, no one who watched Coraline walked away feeling like the ending was a happy one. Sure, we get that little montage of Coraline's life seemingly going back to normal, but there's this lingering sense that things aren't as settled as they seem. The movie leaves us feeling uneasy because the threats Caroline faced were so abstract, so hard to pin down, that nothing about the resolution really feels conclusive. I mean, all we really got was rock beat scissors, plop, the end. 
At no point in this movie can you even discern what's real and what's not. The entire movie blurs the lines between reality and the other world so effectively that by the end, you're left wondering if Caroline truly escaped or if she's still trapped in some twisted version of the other mother's game. This feeling of uncertainty lingers, gnawing at you long after the credits roll. If you couldn't tell, this was a personal one. I am not joking, I had Spongebob on standby whilst analysing this movie for this video, even right now. As always, if you're new here, please like and subscribe, or else Coraline will haunt your dreams tonight.